coming up on the plant-based DFW podcast show. In this episode, you will learn why you need to be at the Lifestyle Medicine Conference that is happening in November. We just have a ton of people who are boots on the ground, people that are actually doing this out in the community, and they'll be sharing their expertise in how they are making lifestyle medicine work in their practice, uh, in their health systems, in their educational systems, like Dr. Brenda Ray, and people that are doing it with the, the lifestyle medicine residency curriculum. So the- Women's health, we have pediatric health as well, lifestyle medicine and pediatric health, you know, mental health, physical activity, uh, sleep as, as you know, as a content expertise. Well, friends, many of you knew that the Lifestyle Medicine Conference was supposed to happen here in Dallas in November, and it's now gone virtual. So now you can go to lmconference.org and buy your ticket. Uh, It's going to be held November 6th through the 10th. And our guest today will talk about the advantages of going to the conference. And they have offered us a discount code of PBDFW10. So before we meet our guests, I do have a message from one of our listeners named Carla. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi, Maya, this is Carla, and I'm just grateful for the work that you're doing in the community. And I just wanted to say thank you and appreciate all that you and Dr. Riz do. Have a great day. Carla, thank you so much for that wonderful message. I always love to hear from our listeners. And like I said, if you ever want to leave us a message, give us any feedback or have any questions for our guests, simply go to potinbox.com forward slash plant-based DFW. One more announcement, everyone. On October 2nd, I'm going to be part of a one-day retreat. The website is tinyurl.com forward slash PPF retreat 2021 and that's for the peaceful planet foundation retreat that's put together every year by dr munish and dr bandana chaula they are such a wonderful couple that practice lifestyle medicine and this whole one day retreat incorporates nutrition yoga meditation just all the things that we talk about in lifestyle medicine and it'll go from about 8 45 in the morning till 3 30 in the afternoon and i will be part of the summit so i will be giving practical tips to getting started on a plant-based diet so i hope that you um, sign up for this they only suggest a ten dollar donation to attend this retreat so i hope that you consider and i also want to mention that i now have a cooking series on our youtube channel it's called cooking with Maya. And every week I just basically invite a guest to cook his or her favorite meal with me and we cook alongside each other virtually. It's live streamed to our YouTube channel, which is Plant Based DFW, or our Facebook page or our Facebook group by the same name. And I would love for you guys to stop by and basically chat with us. Let us know what you think about what we're cooking and feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so let's move on to today's guest. So Dr. Kate Collins is dual board certified in cardiology and lifestyle medicine. She's also the president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and Dr. Megan L. Gorega. She's the co-founder and chief medical officer of the Kellen Foundation, which is dedicated to making the healthy choice the easy choice. And so both of them are here to speak to us about what we can look forward to in terms of the lifestyle medicine, who are going to be the guests, what topics will be covered, and they will talk about the networking opportunities that we will have. I hope you enjoy this episode. So I'm very excited about our two guests today that will talk to us about lifestyle medicine in general and also about what we can look forward to when it comes to the actual virtual conference. Welcome, doctors. Thank you so much for having us here. We're, we're very excited and we're equally honored. You know, for me, I mean, it's, uh, it's nice to have a couple of uh, uh, fellow diplomats. You know, uh, a lot of times I feel like I'm living in a void uh, where uh, I'm kind of the only person in my community or in my area uh, who uh, uh, talks about lifestyle and lifestyle medicine. So I'm, I'm always excited to have conversations with uh, like-minded people. 
Absolutely. And actually, I really feel the same as you, Dr. Riz. I so miss being with all of our colleagues, you know, kind of bringing the tribe back together gets everybody excited and energized and ready to go back out and do amazing things in their community. You know, the yeah. virtual uh, conference is going to be great and it'll be fabulous for everybody to uh, connect virtually. But I'm also looking forward to hopefully 2022 when we get back together, because what you described is the way I feel a lot of lifestyle medicine docs across the country feel is, you know, they're, they're kind of out there by their, themselves. And they're, they're looking for a battle buddy in a way to be able to implement some of these things in their community. And even us getting together is one of those things that we, we uh, preach, which is a sense of community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as part of lifestyle. I was hoping that before we actually talk about the conference that we can hear from each of you, because it's really exciting to hear the work that you're doing. For example, Dr. Collins, I've been watching some of your uh, food demos, which to me uh, are great productions, by the way, you do such a great job with the actual filming, but also the food. You talk about the benefits of using spices. I, I really like the recipes that I've been watching. That is a passion of mine. And, um, one of the ways that I think it's so easy to impart nutritional information is through culinary medicine and through making, I think it is my colleague, uh, Michelle Hauser, who says making healthy food unapologetically delicious. And once you can give uh, someone, you know, a, several recipes to get them started in that journey, it's just so powerful. And, and, um, you know, they, they just follow in suit. So I, I found in my many years of cardiology that oftentimes I would try to inspire and, and educate in, in these one-to-one -one encounters, which is not particularly efficient. But what would often be said at the very end was a patient would say, can you give me a recipe? Because <laughs> they needed that to just get started. And so when I really leveraged and started to uh, work more completely in the field of lifestyle medicine, Culinary medicine was one of the things I wanted to see happen because I really think it's a scalable way to teach nutrition and a fun way for me as well. Definitely. I think that's what I admire so much about you is that you're actually doing it. You're actually offering support. And can you tell us about uh, El Camino and some of the work that you're doing? So in, in my uh, role as a cardiologist uh, for the last you know 25 to 30 years, I began a cardiac rehab program. Uh, you know, I had a big passion in exercise and exercise physiology. And, and most of those programs are uh, traditional programs are really founded in exercise. Uh, but over the years, I found that, uh, you know, that really wasn't the patients were coming back, they needed additional procedures, they weren't getting uh, what they needed in terms of nutrition education. And so I really blossomed that into a more lifestyle augmented uh, cardiac rehab program. And I, I think we, we gained a lot uh, more leverage in, and uh, benefits for our patients in doing that. Uh, but then when I uh, rolled over into director of lifestyle medicine, uh, this is a new uh, small uh, hospital, I'm sorry, small physician group. And um, I had the opportunity to really come in at a foundational level to build around the culture of lifestyle medicine, to build the programs uh, that we would offer, to wrestle with reimbursement, uh, to be in and part of marketing. So I was able to get my hands in a lot of different things. And I was very passionate about a team-based approach. And as I said before, uh, passionate about not only nutrition being the, you know, I think probably the most important pillar of lifestyle medicine and plant-based uh, nutrition, but also uh, exercise and the other pillars. And so I was able to uh, just hire an amazing nutritionist to work with me, uh, an exercise physiologist as well, and a health coach so that we could really uh, build a model of how patients would interact uh, at multiple touch points and with expertise. Uh, so had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I think we've made a big impact in, in addition to educating physicians and educating nurses at the hospital level as well. Um, so lots of, lots of different things that have been a, a wonderful way for me to spend sort of a, a second career, if you will. Um, that's very, you know, particularly interesting to me as, as uh, as you may or may not know, I'm a vascular surgeon, so uh, we uh, we treat the same disease, and uh, I I've always been interested in in rehabilitation 
uh, programs. And uh, it's not, it's obviously, there's not as much of a, an emphasis for us uh, in the vascular world, peripheral vascular world, as there is in the cardiac world. And I think that's a uh, unfortunate thing. Uh, when I was taught about vascular surgery and, and, and revascularization procedures, we were told for people who had uh, uh, complete blockages of their superficial femoral artery in the leg, um, they fare just as well with an intensive rehabilitation program as they would with getting a bypass operation. The sad part is it's easier uh, for them to get the bypass operation. So for every 99, for every 100 people I see with that problem, mm -hmm. essentially 100 of them get a bypass when the reality is uh, uh, they could they could avoid an operation and uh, and change their lifestyle. Something that uh, I, I, I want to ask is your is your program, is it hospital based or is it separate and independent? It's considered the outpatient, but it is right now under the roof of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by the way, we have we do see peripheral vascular disease patients and we have a separate protocol for them because they are now re uh, reimbursed by Medicare uh, well, that PVD. Yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome news. And in fact, uh, and, and Maya and I have bounced this around a lot. Um, I have been interested in maybe starting a, a cardiac rehab program uh, along the lines of uh, lifestyle medicine or, you know, kind of the Dean Ornish approach, which I'm uh, well, I'm more aware of. Uh, and, uh, and and that would just uh, please me to no end to be able to include my patients in that as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you mentioned it's, you know, all of those programs in the past where I was able to get a patient in were so heavily exercise based. Uh, and, uh, and I love the fact that uh, now we're starting to understand the, the importance of the other lifestyle things as well. So I was excited to hear that, you know, you said when you were younger, Dr. Grega, that you were interested in sort of being a healer and you kind of played around with the term shaman. And so that's one reason why you pursue the, you know, medicine, because you wanted to help people. Um, how soon after you actually entered the practice did you realize that, whoa, this is not what I was expecting or hoping for? Well, I'm a family doc, so I am a, you know, primary care out. I, I, I see lots and lots of people all the way from kids to, to elders. And to me, I thought that was the best way to be a healer or, as you uh, mentioned, to be a shaman, you know, to kind of be a part of a tribe, be part of a community, know people's stories uh, and be able to help them, whether it was something that was an acute problem, a chronic problem, all of that sort of thing. And I absolutely love being a primary care doc. And I think that uh, the relationships are the most important thing for all of us as far as our patients and their behavior change. But unfortunately, I, I uh, went to medical school back in the 90s. And so when I entered practice, we were really getting into that whole RVU sort of system and how many patients can you get through the door and, um, you know, 15 minutes per patient and actually probably usually more than that, uh, more patients a day than you could possibly see and spend the time with them. And then I realized that even though I was doing all of the evidence-based guidelines for things like hypertension and hyperlipidemia, heart disease, diabetes, uh, you know, seeing my kids for their well child checks and talking about uh, decreasing screen time and you know, having more fruits and vegetables, decreasing their sweetened beverages, all of those things were really not making much of an impact on my patients because mm -hmm. it seemed like I would only see them once or twice, a, you know, a few times a year, and they really needed more uh, intensive interventions. And as I was seeing my patients, you know, kind of needing more blood pressure medicine or needing more diabetes medicine, I said, there has to be a better way. And that's when I started to dive into the literature and found uh, the works of, you know, Dean Ornish and Caldwell Esselstyn and Neil Barnard and, you know, all of uh, T. Colin Campbell, all of the, the giants that we kind of like stand on their shoulders. And I realized that there was a to me, a better, more sustainable way that's going to get better outcomes for our patients. And that is focusing on their lifestyle choices. I mean, we still need to have the acute care available for our patients. But if we do not pay attention to the chronic disease uh, care and the prevention, we're missing out on about 80% of what our healthcare system is about. So it was probably only a couple of years after I started in practice that I said, whoa, this is not exactly the direction I want to be going. Because of that, that realization that you had, then you really started to work 
towards outreaching or working with your community. And you've said that your foundation, the Kellen Foundation, is sort of like your ikigai. It's your reason, your reason for existing. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit about what you do? I, I find it absolutely fascinating because I I was a school teacher. So hearing you talk about teaching children how to, for example, grow their own vegetables, really appreciating gardening, I think is absolutely wonderful. Well, Kellen Foundation is really kind of structured to take lifestyle medicine approaches out into the community. So it's kind of getting out of our clinics, out of our hospitals, into the places where people live and work and play. So we have something that we call our healthy neighborhood immersion strategy. And that's really focusing resources on a neighborhood, which we define as the catchment area for an elementary school. So we use the elementary school as our hub and we provide uh teaching to the students. So interactive, healthy lifestyle educations in the classrooms, as well as the garden as a classroom program, which is raised beds at the schools that the kids grow some of their own real food. That's part of what we call our Kellen Schools programs. We are reaching about 10,000 students every year in that program. And we see students longitudinally. So it's not just once. We come in in third grade, we come in in fourth grade, fifth grade, and kind of have a, a, a building of information over time. We also have what's called Kellen Kitchens, which is doing plant-based cooking classes out into the community. So at YMCA's or senior centers, uh, community centers where kids are having their summer programs so that kids and adults, families are all getting a chance to actually try this type of food, cook this type of food with us. Just like Dr. Collins said, recipes are so important. And so is actually a parent or a grandparent watching their child eat food that they would never have thought <laughs> that that child would eat. I've had parents come up to me and they're like, I never thought he would eat something green, broccoli. I never thought he would eat broccoli. Or I had another uh, mom come up and she was like, this is surprisingly delicious. I think I might actually make this. You know, So that kind of experiential learning is so, so important. Um, so doing that in the community as well as um, Kellen Food Access, because if you have the education, but you don't have the ability to access this type of food, you're not really going to be able to be helping your patients. So mm -hmm. our Kellen Food Access has to do with the Eat Real Food mobile market, and that's taking a um, trailer into areas of food insecurity. It's a 24-foot trailer. Actually, this year we have two of them going out to the different areas in our community where we provide uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, and healthy lifestyle prepared meals. So these are meals that are whole food plant-based that are kind of grab and go to get over some of the issues that people have with access, but also convenience. Because all of us that are actually eating a whole food plant-based diet, we all know that sometimes there is not enough time to cook. You know, like you have to put that into your schedule, prioritize batch cooking and things like that. And sometimes you're on the go, you need something. And so the lifestyle medicine meals that our um, executive chef, Chef Amanda makes, is another thing that we send out into the, into the neighborhoods. And then our fourth pillar of the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy is actually lifestyle medicine, um, intensive therapeutic lifestyle change interventions that we hold out in the community, things like the CHIP program or other similar sort of things. So we try to wrap the whole community in this Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy to help change the social norms that everyone in that community are, are kind of participating in and also change the choice architecture to make that healthy choice the easy choice so that it's the default to have something healthy, whether it's exercise, social connection, you know, decreased screen time, the, the food that we eat, stress reduction, as opposed to what it is right now, unfortunately, for most of us, it is not the default to have healthy choices. The default is to have things that are really kind of uh, damaging our health over the long run. How long have you been doing this, uh, these programs? We started in 2007 um, and we started, so yeah, huh. we're, we're going into our 15th year now. That's so our amazing. first, but we didn't do this all at once. We couldn't like start with all of this. We started actually with the intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs, because mm -hmm. for me as a family doc, that was my, my initial entry into, you know, behavior change and lifestyle medicine was I'm not able to do these things for my patients in my office. So how can I do these things? And we started running those mm -hmm. programs out in the community. And we realized that the, the families and the kids that were part of our programming did very well during the intensive time that they were with us. But then once the program was over, we kind of like sent them back out into the obesogenic environment that they already lived in. And, and it was not, um, you know, they struggled. So we said, OK, we need to try and look at the community that we live in and change that as well. And that's when we started with the schools. So that was our next uh, pillar. Then we actually started with the cooking because we were um, going to a an after school program where we were going to maybe start an intervention program with the, the students there. And there was also a WIC 
uh, office at that place. And the WIC office uh, staff were saying that they had $20 vouchers that they could give the um, parents for fresh farm food from like a farmer's market in the area. Mm -hmm. And the parents were handing it back and saying that they didn't know how to cook with that food. Oh my and God. Wow. My co-founder and I were like, what? You know, like, this is terrible. <laughs> this is like food that this is like money on the table for these people. And so we figured if a doctor and a business guy, because my co-founder for Kellen Foundation is a uh, is a business guy and he's an accountant and marketing and all that stuff. Like if we can figure out how to cook with vegetables, we should be able to teach other people how to. And so that's how the, the Kellen Kitchens part started. And the last piece uh, that's just been going on for about six years now is the food access piece, which is definitely the most infrastructure intensive, but it adds that missing piece of making it so that the food is in the areas that people live or work or, or play anyway, so that it's easy for them to pick that food up and know how to cook it. Hopefully have their kids like it already because the kids have been through the school programs and the cooking programs, and it helps shift people's attitudes about healthy food and healthy lifestyles in general. So have you been able to uh, see the impact of uh, this work over 15 years and, uh, and are, how are you measuring it? So with different programs, we measure it differently. Like the school programs are pre and post tests for knowledge gain. Um, and also you can get like testimonials and things like that from what's going on with the kids. But what I love more than anything is since we've been doing this for so long is some of the kids that we've taught in elementary school have gone all the way through high school, have come back to volunteer with us. You know, they see us mm -hmm. out in the community. They talk about, uh, they actually help us now teach the cooking classes and things like that. Several of them have gone on to, uh, careers in, in health sciences in one way or another. Um, as far as the intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs that we do more biometrics, you know, weight and blood pressure and labs and things like right. that. With food access, it's really how many pounds of uh, produce and, and healthy meals are we getting out in the community? And so in 2020, we provided over 80,000 pounds of fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains and the um, healthy lifestyle medicine meals in our areas of food insecurity. And we don't give it out for free or we're actually, you know, selling it, but we're trying to keep our price point as affordable and uh, similar to grocery store prices as possible. But okay. we're making it convenient. We're putting it out in the area where people where people are. Um, and we also have a fruit and vegetable prescription voucher program, which has to do with different patient populations. So we track those sorts of things based on what the patient issue is. Um, and then as far as the Kelling Kitchens, that's really more how many people are involved in it. And uh, we don't see like we don't w measure people's weight change or things like that over time. But sometimes we do surveys asking how they're changing their behavior. So it depends on the program. Um, but we have a bunch of different metrics that's that are specific to the program that we're talking about. And I think one of the ones that I like the best is the fact that we're reaching those 10,000 students throughout the Lehigh Valley every year. And when we see their knowledge gain of, um, you know, how knowing how many fruits and vegetables they're supposed to eat a day and what counts as a red, yellow or green food, if it's a processed food or knowing how to make better choices when they're eating out, you know, like that to me is like that ripple that you put the you put the pebble in the in the water and you see the ripples going out <laughs> because we know that that's going to impact not only themselves, but, you know, hopefully how they're going to raise their own children. And, you know, you've talked about the billions of dollars that are spent in treating, for example, cardiovascular disease uh, related conditions. Um, the United States, like we as a country spend right. over eleven thousand dollars per person per year on health care. And as Dr. Collins, I, I know would agree. And unfortunately, most of it is not health care. It's really more sick care. It's it's what yeah. we do for people once they've already gotten the chronic diseases. Um, mm -hmm. And not very much is spent on the prevention of or the reversal of those um, chronic diseases. What you were just talking about your programs is that you are focusing on the prevention part of it. And especially with communities that uh, face food insecurities, for example. And so that's what both of you are doing is teaching people how to cook at home, um, using exercise as medicine. Uh, let's start with the growing trend of lifestyle medicine. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that we met, we met a young girl going into medical school who was already interested in lifestyle medicine. And we, we couldn't believe it. We we're like, how did you even hear about this information? How do you know that you want to incorporate this as a physician? So what are you currently seeing in terms of the trend? Right. So if you just if you just look at our membership trend, um, since I think we had not too long after I joined um, in uh, 2016, we had between 500 and 1,000 
uh, members. And we are now uh, up to 7,000, nearly 7,000 and, and just growing. You know, our monthly increase in membership is just off the map. Um, and then if you look at, just as you said, just the overall understanding, for instance, at the medical school level, um, that lifestyle medicine is a thing, that it's something that they can recognize in their, in their medical school. Uh, in 2009, uh, there was just one lifestyle medicine member interest group. Uh, so at one uh, medical school, but uh, in 2021, there are now like 54 medical schools that have a lifestyle medicine interest group. And that has you know, been birthed out of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine um, as well. And then we also have uh, some interest groups at the bachelor's level um, and uh, at the graduate level as well. Uh, so as you, as you said, it's surprising and I've run across the same thing when I've, I've seen young uh, uh, you know, budding physicians or those in their undergrad that they'll actually begin to recognize lifestyle medicine as a thing. And then if you look at our, our growth into residencies, and there's been just um, some beautiful work done by uh, several of our members in education uh, that are in education and academics, um, they have had four pilot sites where uh, lifestyle medicine curriculum was embedded into uh, the residencies. And in 2021, that's just uh, three years later, we have a total of 48 uh, sites implementing across 82 residency uh, sites. So, uh, you know, the the growth and, and the understanding and the, I would say the demand for this is really exponential uh, since we began. If we can talk about some of the interest groups also that I'm part of the women's interest group for lifestyle medicine, and a lot of the individuals in the group are physicians. Now, that's one of my questions, since there is this growing trend, individuals like myself, a lay person that's not uh, trained in any of these particular fields, can they just come on board and become members of ACLM and join interest groups? Or how does that work? Yes, anyone can join an interest group and virtually anyone can, uh, I mean, practically anyone can, can join uh, ACLM. Uh, there's different categories, membership categories, uh, ranging from uh, physician level, PhD level, allied health level, uh, and then, you know, a, another level, which is health coaches, uh, people that might be in marketing of lifestyle medicine, um, of course, educators, uh, psychologists and so forth, uh, but also pretty much anyone who's interested in lifestyle medicine can become a member uh, in, in their particular category and at, and through their membership can be a part of one of the uh, member interest groups. Okay, so Riz took his board exam in 2019. And after that, I came back to Dallas super excited uh, and wanted to just encourage people to jump on board and get board certified. And so 2020 was the first time I, I believe you offered um, the online exam. And so we were surprised to hear how many people we know in our circle that actually took the, the, the uh, exam and became board certified. Yeah, Ma Maya is actually <laughs> responsible for encouraging probably two or three people to go out and get uh, uh, certified. So good job. Well, the whole goal has been to really build a community in Dallas, but really everywhere of a group of people like a team that that are like minded so that we can um, offer support. And so what um, a registered dietitian that we work closely with was excited about it all. And, um, and so Riz and several people that took the board exam actually said it was a tough exam. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about that for individuals who might be considering um, being, you know, becoming certified? So yes, I think the exam is a tough exam, and th and that's important because we want to set, you know, we want to set a standard for for folks. Um, having said that, the resources uh, for you know for uh, studying for that exam are, are, are there. Um, the Lifestyle Medicine Board Review course, the Core Competencies course, these both prepare uh, people very well for the, for the uh, exam, uh, whether at the uh, ABLM level or at the ACLM certifi certification level. So lots of resources. And as you indicated, uh, last year, we allowed the 30 CMEs from the conference that was virtual also to qualify people to take the exam. 
that was the first year that we allowed the virtual CMEs to qualify uh, people. And we're new, doing that again this year because we, we don't want the fact that we need to host a virtual uh, exam to be an obstacle for people to gain their necessary CMEs mm -hmm. uh, for, for the, as it, as it were in live, but virtual. Uh, so, so lots and lots of resources uh, and uh, just can't encourage people enough to just go ahead and go for it. We often have people come on, especially psychologists that come on and talk about motivational interviewing and how to put together practical goals that are doable and obtainable. I think that motivational interviewing is a critical skill for all physicians. So lifestyle medicine really needs it, but like all physicians kind of need that motivational interviewing because just because we tell people to do things like patients doesn't mean that they are going to do things. Like you have to, mm -hmm. you have to have a partnership. You have to talk about it together and set these goals. So motivational interviewing, I've heard some of our lifestyle medicine colleagues say, shift it from saying, what's the matter with you? to being what matters to you. And so if you know mm -hmm. what matters to your patient, whether it's that they want to make sure that they can dance at their daughter's wedding, or they want to be able to go fishing with their grandchild, or, you know, they want to be able to enjoy their retirement and be still physically active. You know, it, it's different for everybody, but knowing what is their goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then how do you help them get there by their behavior changes and talk to them about what they are and are not willing to, um, you know, engage in. And that's kind of what motivational interviewing does. It decides, are you in pre-contemplation phase, which means don't talk to me about it. I'm not going to change it. <laughs> or are you in contemplation or preparation stage where you're like, oh, I'm thinking about it. We might be able to work on something here. Or are you actually, okay, I'm in action. I want to do this. And that's a great place where a physician, either at preparation or at action, where a physician can be like, okay, let's make a goal. Let's set it together. And I think Maya, you were talking about like goals that are doable. And we think of those as smart goals, you know, things that are mm -hmm. specific and measurable and achievable mm -hmm. and relevant and time focused or time, time bound, because it's one thing to tell somebody, Hey, you should exercise more. Well, how, mm -hmm. how do you know if you are meeting that goal? Like more than what? Like, but if you say, okay, how about if you make a goal, this is smart goal, to exercise, go for a walk for 10 minutes after dinner, at least five times a week with your spouse. And we'll talk about it again when you come back in and see me in two weeks. Like that, mm -hmm. somebody can come in and say, yes, I achieved that. And you can then you can move forward with your next goal. So I think lifestyle medicine is so focused on behavior because we know that that's what makes the, the long-term difference for our patients. But we have to use tools that patients can understand whether they're actually making progress or not, and not just say, eat better, get more sleep, don't be so stressed, and you know you should exercise more help with those specific goals that you're talking about and motivational interviewing gets you to the point of knowing what goals are the right ones for you to start working on with the patient. Mm -hmm. Then you can make a smart goal that'll, that they'll be able to work on and come back and talk to you about. So let's talk about what we can look forward to. So we're not going to meet in person, which I'm really disappointed about. What can you guys share in terms of who will be speaking and what sort of content will be covered and anything else you'd like to tell us about the conference? We have, um, women's health uh, covered quite uh, robustly. We have pediatric health as well, lifestyle medicine and pediatric health. Uh, we have the pillars of you know, mental health, physical activity, uh, sleep as, as, you know, as a content expertise. Uh, for the last several years, we've had culinary medicine and that will be happening again this year. Uh, we also have um, digital health solutions in lifestyle medicine highlighted. And then we have bigger picture topics. Uh, one that is going to be uh, Megan's topic, which is lifestyle medicine as a solution uh, to healthcare spending, which is so important. And then, you know, ACLM and, and many health organizations are, are really passionate about health equity now. And so we will have a session on health equity uh, and as you said, motivational interviewing is is part of the overall area of coaching. So there will be um, expertise in coaching. And we have, you know, 14 workshops. These workshops are pre and post conference. So um, there's just an enormous amount um, of information to be gained. And, and I don't know if uh, Megan can tell you about a few specific uh, people who will be presenting. 
I'm actually the conference chair for for twenty uh, for twenty twenty one, and of course we've kind of been having a little bit of a roller coaster, like we know from the going from in person to virtual. But we're very excited with the the lineup of speakers that are coming. And uh, as far as the one of the ones that I'm really thrilled is going to be there is uh, Dr. Marty Macari, who actually he and I went to college together, and now he's uh, actually one of the amazing. He's just did an amazing. Um, book release and he's he's at Hopkins and is really focused on value in healthcare and how we can fix the the issues as far as the amount of money that we're spending in healthcare versus the type of return on investment we're getting in our in our outcomes. So he's going to be one of our main kickoff speakers, but we also have a bunch of our other people that um, from all the way from people like David Donahue and uh, Padmaja Patel, and we just have a ton of people who are boots on the ground, people that are actually doing this out in the community, and they'll be sharing their expertise in how they are making lifestyle medicine work in their practice, uh, in their health systems, in their educational systems, like Dr. Brenda Ray, and people that are doing it with the, the lifestyle medicine residency curriculum. So there's something for everybody. There's definitely also from a positive psychology standpoint and registered dietitian standpoint, how are people uh, implementing mm -hmm. it in their practice? So the other cool thing about it being virtual, I mean, I would have loved to have all been together, but the thing that's awesome about the virtual part is you don't have to miss anything now because <laughs> what happens is the, the stuff is recorded. And so once you are attending the conference, you're able to look at the recordings at your leisure through the end of December. So you actually get to go to everything. There won't be the, the things of, of missing <laughs> one thing or another. <laughs> Uh, the only thing is like for workshops, you'd have to sign up for each of the workshops. But if you want to go to every single thing, you can. Yeah. I love going to summits and or conferences, anything like that. So I don't mind if they're virtual. And I don't mind actually spending that extra time in the evening or whenever I have time to kind of review the workshops or the content that I might have missed. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, you can even sleep in and still still yeah. attend everything. <laughs> Absolutely. But there is still going to be virtual networking. So, you know, make sure you're on live for that point so that we can all like <laughs> yeah. talk with each other and, and kind of get that a little bit of that energy that you remember from the regular conferences. So two things, I'm assuming since this is the second time you'll be doing the virtual conference that, the, you know, it's going to be even, probably even better because you've had the opportunity to run it once. And then what does the networking look like? Well, there's the member interest group meetings. That's actually pre-conference, uh, but those happen on November 3rd and 4th. So that's a great way to network. Uh, you don't have to be currently in that member interest group. You know, you can you can uh, sign up to go to a member interest group meeting, even if you haven't like signed up to be a part of that member interest group yet. So that's a great way. So they, with, we have so many different member interest groups to uh, that there's something for everybody, whether you're in pediatrics, whether you're in women's health, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, the HEAL group, which is health equity achieved through lifestyle medicine. So that's really focused on people who maybe have not had access to lifestyle medicine approaches before. Tons of different things. I'm one of the co-chairs of the reimbursement uh, member interest group. So that one always gets a lot of a lot of traction during the uh, during the conferences. So that's one way you can network mm -hmm. through the mem member interest group meetings. The other way is that there'll be, uh, I believe, set up times like there was last year where you can uh, network with people that are from your region. So we usually set it up in regions and mm -hmm. uh, maybe like Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, you know, West Coast, stuff like that. And you'll know then which um, which virtual networking room to go into so that you can meet people that are kind of geographically close. And that's a great way to find out what other people are doing in your area. I like the idea of being able to kind of pop in, you know, and and checking out the uh, interest group conversation to see if maybe it's a good fit. And heal, um, I can you t uh, say that one more time? So it's health equity achieved through lifestyle medicine. There's been times where people have thought of lifestyle medicine as being more of like an elitist thing. You know, it's it's for people who can pay for it, right? And mm -hmm. our goal as a college, and I think as as practitioners of lifestyle medicine, is to have this type of of um, healthcare available for everyone. And that's what the HEAL group is really looking at is, okay, how can we teach more, for example, students that are in historically black colleges and universities, how can we expose them to this as maybe a, a, a career path that they would go into? How do we do the type of cooking demonstrations that, you know, like that we do with Kellen Foundation and that Dr. Collins does? How do we get those out into the community for people who maybe wouldn't be able to 
afford uh, to pay for a cooking class, you know, and, and if you're doing it as part of your health care, okay, great. So how do you get that out to an area where the patient's can be if there's a transportation problem or, um, you know, a, a timing problem. That's another big thing is a lot of times for healthcare, we think about like, oh, we'll, we'll provide services from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m., you know, Monday through Friday. Well, a lot of our patients may not be able to come to a group visit then, or they may not be able to come to a culinary medicine thing then. So mm -hmm. looking at shifting it to, hey, can we do it at the local YMCA or the local um, school or maybe at a senior center and do it in the evening and all share dinner together, you know, stuff like that. So the mm -hmm. HEAL group is very diverse and has a lot of different, definitely not just physicians, it has tons of different professionals in it, all looking at how can we uh, expand the use of lifestyle medicine in all of our communities. People like myself, how can we motivate our physicians to take interest in lifestyle medicine? Does the college actually offer content that we can take to our physicians to kind of inform them about lifestyle medicine? There is a lot of educational content that uh, for, for physicians and other providers through um, ACLM and, you know, there's non-member rates and there's member rates. So, uh, you know, gaining one of the ways I gained some traction in my community uh, for, you know, bringing this is by getting a foundation support, hospital foundation support uh, for physicians to get CME and to uh, study for uh, one of the lifestyle medicine uh, curriculums, whether it's food as medicine, whether it's core curriculum, whether it's the lifestyle medicine um, board review course. Uh, so some ways to bring this forward is to make it easy for uh, for your colleagues to, you know, get a taste of lifestyle medicine uh, by by sharing with them um, the opportunity to gain CMEs, you know, on a free basis, um, maybe through some kind of a foundation support for that. Uh, similarly, doing that with um, other providers in, in your network, again, just allowing people to sort of safely explore uh, this field um, as well. You know, I was also thinking, uh, like Dr. Grega was talking about the networking opportunity is that especially when we network with people regionally, then we see we start to possibly build those connections so that we can collaborate and work uh, and possibly even build a team. I know that's been kind of a fantasy of ours, like we play yeah. around with the idea that what will we do when Riz retires from surgery? Well, we'd love to do like we'd like to do full time lifestyle medicine. Uh, interestingly enough, I just uh, uh, changed my disability uh, uh, insurance to that would uh, allow me if I can't practice as a vascular surgeon, uh, it, uh, it still allows me to uh, practice mm -hmm. plant based or uh, lifestyle lifestyle medicine and not and not uh, ruin my disability. So <laughs> I've, I'm already thinking ahead, you know. <laughs> And I was thinking that um, as far as what you were saying, Maya, as far as getting other people involved, you know, having Dr. Riz go and do grand rounds or teach at the medical schools. Like before I became, now I am faculty for uh, Lewis Katz School of Medicine and at Temple, St. Luke's. And also I'm faculty for the Lifestyle Medicine Residency Curriculum, but I didn't start out as faculty like that. I started out as just being a doc in the community with Kellen Foundation offering to go lecture to the residency programs and offering to lecture to the medical students. And so over time, in a way, we built up a bunch of residents and medical students who are like, hey, I want to know more about this stuff because I was just coming in and giving lectures about lifestyle medicine as part of their didactic days or part of their academic days. The other thing I would say is very good is stories. So if you have stories of a success of a patient who made it made a big change, not just you telling the story, but if you can get that patient to give you a little like, you know, taped blip or something like that, that you can show to other physicians, that makes a difference. And then um, giving them some of the resources like like the TED talk that I've done. Dr. Ditya has done one on sleep. Uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine webpage has all sorts of resources where you can just give like a one pager about lifestyle medicine, return on investment, chronic disease costs, stuff like that. So don't like don't overwhelm them with too much at once. It's like little touches here, there, here, there, do a grand rounds, you know, go talk to some medical students. Actually, the other thing that works really well is is community organizations like I've talked to so many rotary clubs and um, book groups and things, women's community groups because then you get the groundswell from the patients 
And the patients start to go to their doctors and be like, hey, I just heard this thing about that I could reverse my or potentially improve or reverse my diabetes. How come we haven't talked about that? And you start to it takes time. But over time, you start to build that that kind of critical mass of people that are agitating for lifestyle medicine approaches just in time for you, Dr. Riz, to retire into treating all of them. So that'll be perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I, I work in a uh, uh, small community hospital. And so we all, all, we all know each other. Uh, and uh, so there's a couple of things I, I'd, I'd love to share with you. Number one is when I kind of became full on lifestyle medicine and whole food plant based, I was known as the crazy doctor. Uh, and, uh, because I was kind of the weirdo, I was doing something different, which was so different from the standard American mm -hmm. diet. Uh, and now about five years later, I'm now known as the healthy doctor. Uh, and, and that's universal uh, in the hospital by the, the, the administration, the physicians, the nurses. Uh, and so uh, they, they have that their, their mindset has changed, which I, which I love. And it's through just that constant just being, uh, uh, you know, sharing information and being an example, I think. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, again, since it's a small community, um, we we work very closely with all the other physicians, and so my my patients are seen by uh, just a few cardiologists or by a few family practice doctors. And when I get a patient to change uh, substantially, like uh, a guy today who I I uh, uh, saw in the clinic, he's lost forty pounds, uh, and he he went to his cardiologist recently, and he told his cardiologist about. It, and he said, "Oh, you must be Doctor Bukhari's patient." Uh, because, you know, <laughs> uh, here's a vascular surgeon getting people to make lifestyle changes. Uh, and he, you know, so the, it's, uh, it is working and, you know, we, uh, you know, it's, it's working at that community level for us. There are what I call converts, a lot of converts in the, in the, uh, hospital, uh, uh from administration, several people in administration, um, and then, uh, lots of nurses, lots of staff, but the one, the hardest people for me to get through to are doctors. And, uh, uh, I find that very, uh, you may be not too surprising because doctors are very opinionated and, and stubborn, uh, I think, but, uh, at the same time, it's, it's confusing to me because you'd think that, uh, they're the ones who got, uh, all the training and background and, and maybe would hope you'd hope they'd have that aha moment, uh, where they begin to realize that there is a better way. Yeah. I think it's the evidence in the literature that we need to use for the doctors. Like yeah. that's, that's what seems to be the, the most effective for me is we've started to run lifestyle medicine journal clubs and I pick the articles to show and some, I use some of the foundational articles, but I also have been using some of the ones coming out about COVID and uh, the severity index, depending on, you know, what sort of diet somebody's eating or what sort of comorbidities they have. And not all doctors are open to it, but a lot more doctors have been saying to me, why didn't I know about this? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know this was out in the literature. Like, they've never heard about Dean Ornish's um, uh, the, the heart lifestyle trial. They, they've never yeah. heard about some of the stuff that Neil Barnard is doing with diabetics. And so they're they're shocked. And then it makes them at least more open to, hey, this is not just something that's kind of like voodoo. This is actually the foundational literature is there. It's just that we as physicians were not taught it and we're mm -hmm. not really necessarily keeping up on it because it's not, um, it's not being kind of put in our face the way this stuff is like the, the blood pressure trials that are talking about, um, you know, the medication That's aspect cool. or the, or the diabetes trials. The people that I find the most open to it though, are the residents and the medical students. And I think that's where we, not that we shouldn't be trying to talk to the doctors that are already out in practice. They need to be kind of like brought into the fold if they're interested in everything as well. But for the younger doctors, it's like introducing them to the literature at the exact same time that they're hearing about the stuff for the statins or for the, you know, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you deal with a patient in the ICU? And so they're, they're putting it into their worldview. And I'm hoping that that is going to make a difference moving forward for our, our whole profession of doctors. Yeah, I actually, I really do think that is uh, really important. And that's one of our focuses is we teach, uh, uh, you know, go to the medical schools and teach students. And uh, and, and I, I, I see that as a, a ray of hope for us uh, as a society. Uh, Dr. Greg, I want to ask you one question that's been on my mind and maybe a little bit off topic here. And, you, you know, you talked about this uh, concept where you got to see four patients an hour and you're, you're you know, uh, and that is to me, it is a little bit contrary to what we really want to do, which is spend some time with our patients and educate them and, and, and then find their motivation and do motivational interviewing and, and, and give them this, these, uh, uh, 
uh, smart goals and, and prescriptions. And you can't do that in 15 minutes. So what are you doing in your own practice uh, to, to, to try to make up for that? Or how do you, how do you get to them and how do, you, how do you teach them? So what I am teaching the residents to do, because at this point I spend so much time in Kellen Foundation that I'm not mm -hmm. seeing as many patients myself, mm -hmm. but okay. what I was doing and what I'm teaching the residents to do while we, while we precept and everything is give homework. So what you would do is you, you have the patient come in for whatever their visit is, and find out uh, that maybe they have a, a lifestyle related chronic disease like hypertension or obesity and say, OK, do a little bit of motivational interviewing to find out whether they're ready to, to make some changes, either with exercise or their their diet or their stress levels, things like that. And then say, OK, th this is such an important topic. I really want to talk to you more about this. Let me give you a link to, and we have a bunch of different TED Talks and Dr. Michael Greger nutrition.facts.org uh, videos, and we have handouts and things like that. We say, okay, here's a bit of homework for you to do. <laughs> I want you to go home and watch this, or I want you to go home and read about this. And then I want you to come back and see me in two weeks or a week or whatever we can, we can put into the schedule. And let's talk about what you thought about it and what we can do for you to make a plan for you. And so- the best thing in our current system, I think, is to have more frequent visits with your patients. They may be short, but they're kind of like following up more frequently to say, hey, this is important because we would do that if we were changing their blood pressure medicine, right? We would do that if we were changing their diabetes medicine. We'd have them come back mm -hmm. and see how they're doing. So do yeah. the same thing with lifestyle. The other thing that I think is very helpful is shared medical appointments. So some of it is you do it one on one. And then some of it is, okay, great. We are doing a shared medical appointment for people with high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Mm. Then yeah. you can spend the, you know, like the hour and a half kind of really yeah. talking with people. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we still have to advocate for longer visits and more things like that, but we can use technology also to say, here's your health risk assessment to take home with you, bring it back. Here's your homework to look at until we, until you, um, until I see you again. And then you're not having to go through everything yourself with the patient. You're having them be kind of like an adult learner. They're learning some of it. Then they come back and you talk about questions that are specific to them. What about uh, using uh, dietitians and health coaches? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have access to them, <laughs> those are awesome. But what we find um, from a reimbursement, from a, from a cost yes. standpoint, uh, health coaches are difficult if you're in a regular system, um, just because yeah. those would be for people who can either self-pay or if the practice has figured out a way to cover the cost, because it's, it's very difficult to bill for a health coach. Now, a right. dietitian, if you've got a, somebody that you know is a plant-based dietitian, because not all dietitians that we send people to are maybe you know singing, singing from the same song sheet. So if you have one that you're like, okay, I know that we're, we're talking the same game here, a dietitian definitely is helpful to send um, people to. And again, sometimes group visits with dietitians work well because they can they can bill for group visits easier, uh, like group medical nutrition therapy. And so, if you have somebody in your in your um, area that you know is going to be giving the same type of uh, information that you are, I think dietitians are a lot easier to bring into the care team. Um, physical therapy. So like for exercise, if somebody is, uh, has a chronic disease and has issues with their joints or something, you may be able to get a personalized physical therapy program together and have that covered depending on what the patient's insurance is mm -hmm. and things like uh, licensed clinical social workers or behavioral health people are also awesome to bring into your care team if the insurance coverage is available. So that's, that's the, uh, the dilemma I think with lifestyle medicine in a primary care practice right now is if you're building your own primary care practice and it's it's a private thing that you're figuring out what team members can get paid for and how that's going to happen, you can do all these awesome things of having a health coach and a dietitian and maybe a behavioral health person or have your medical assistants doing some of the chronic disease management stuff. If you're in a health network and you're kind of more an employed physician, it may be a little bit more challenging to get some of those things into your office, but you yourself can still do the shared medical appointments, the homework assignments, and referring your patients out to like a dietitian or a um, you know physical therapist, as long as their insurance will cover that. Just because it can't be covered doesn't necessarily mean that patients aren't willing to do it. And so we have to 
we have to kind of have some of that information about our own insurance market to know like, hey, if I send you, are you going to end up with a $300 bill or not? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Question, Dr. Collins, have you seen a rise in telemedicine? And did you mention that that something like that will be covered in the conference in terms of like how to offer services virtually? You know, I think the silver lining in the in the pandemic has been the, you know, acceleration of, of uh, virtual care and telemedicine and uh, people trying out the, the digital health monitoring the tools that are available. You know, I think people were waiting and waiting. These were great ideas. This is, you know, the, the world of the future. And then the, mm -hmm. the future was sort of thrust upon us and and people had to rapidly adopt these uh, these uh, tools. So, yes, um, in the conference, there will be um, uh, digital health uh, talks. There will be um, shared medical appointment talks and, and including how to deliver shared medical appointments, which is, um, as Megan said, one of the ways that we can spend more time with patients and, and be more effective in, in uh, behavior change and in uh, patients uh, acquiring the knowledge that they need and the ability to include uh, more of these team members in that model. Uh, so information on shared medical appointments, information on virtual delivery of those and other things. And so, yes, we're into that world. And, and a lot of our members have really activated uh, mm -hmm. in that, that and can share that expertise with others. Along those lines, things like the um, remote patient monitoring and some mm -hmm. of the things that you can also do to that are not exactly telehealth, but are things that can um, seem to be utilized a lot more now that we've had the pandemic because people weren't coming in for their blood pressure checks. You know, they weren't coming in for their um, diabetes appointments as much, but there's mm -hmm. technology that can be used to do some of that remotely. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Or maybe anything you'd like our listeners to know in terms of a project that you're working on? I know both of you are staying pretty busy. Just really a, a reach out to the entire audience uh, to come this year to our virtual conference. I think our registration fees are excellent and you can get a 10% discount, um, those that are listeners uh, to this podcast with uh, PBDFW10. Um, so if you haven't tried us out, uh, please try us out this year. You won't be disappointed and uh, you'll leave with uh, just you know amazing tools and camaraderie ship to to move lifestyle medicine in your own community, in your own practice. So one other thing I would mention too, is the research that you'll see at the conference. There is mm. something I believe like we have over almost 80 different research abstracts that people are going to be, uh, mm. some of them they'll be verbally talking through. Some of them will just be things that you can click on and look at, but mm. it's amazing to me to see the breadth of research projects that are now going on, um, both in the academic level and out in the community level in lifestyle medicine. And so that's a great place to find inspiration. If you're thinking like, how can I kind of get started yes. in this? Or how can I dip my toe in? Look at what some of the other people across the country are doing and say, huh, okay, maybe I could figure out a way to make that work too. Any idea um, how many people will be sitting for the exam this year? The registered number uh, for for uh, this year for ABLM is... Uh, 385. It's probably higher than when I got that figure. Mm -hmm. And then for the international board, it's uh, 429 are registered oh, already. So <laughs> lots of registrations come in towards the end. So I, I'm sure we're going to see uh, some amazing numbers. Mm -hmm. And I would add that, you know, there is a World Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance or Council uh, that and we are seeing the growth of this field um, in uh, so many other countries. And, um, you know, we're we're a global uh, community and um, you, people are recognizing the importance of lifestyle medicine abroad as well. I've enjoyed uh, our time together. I could probably uh, pick your brains for lots of stuff. That's both interesting to me and our audience. But uh, I know we have a limited amount of time. So thank you both. Thank you so much. And I will include um, all your links and your full bios in the show notes of um, both the audio and the video um, versions. And yes, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate you um, just having the conversation, but also getting the word out about the conference because we can't wait to see all the people that are going to show up at LM 2021 this year. Thank you. 
Thank you again for listening. Tell me what you think about this. Are you going to be able to make the Lifestyle Medicine Conference virtually? Remember that the website is lmconference.org and enter this discount code PBDFW10. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the Plant-Based DFW Podcast Show. To hear more fascinating episodes, simply visit plantbaseddfwpodcast.com. And also do me a favor, leave us a voicemail and tell us what you thought about today's episode. Simply go to podinbox.com forward slash plantbaseddfw. Our goal is to provide quality episodes to help support the community.